Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, every year. I think I'm happier to to get here and be on this stage and look out and see so many friends and and colleagues. And uh, this year, maybe more than any other year, I, I have to tell you, we we've accomplished together extraordinary things. Uh, I'm going to share with you some of our data and some of our metrics that talk about this. But when I think about the extraordinary things that we've accomplished, and and I've been dwelling on this quite a bit. I realize that it's it's really about you, and and if I had a theme about what I want to talk about today, it is you did it, and and you did amazing things. The accomplishments that we make with our students every year are are one to one, one one to class, one faculty to student, uh, staff member supporting student. I recognize that what we accomplish together really comes down to the face-to-face interactions that we have with our students and how they feel about the experience, the experience of being a Pikes Peak Community College student, whether they're learning, whether they're gaining, whether somebody believes in them and is encouraging them, nurturing them, challenging them. And you've done all of those things. And I'm really excited to tell you about where we've come. And this is a watershed year for us. I would say for a number of years, we've been making gains. But to the graph you see in front of you is the number of degrees and certificates awarded by our college. Five out of the last six years, we've set record numbers for the number of graduates uh, from Pikes Peak Community College, the number of degrees and certificates awarded. But this year, we went from 2,746 last year, which was a record, most we had ever awarded, to 3,711. We increased by almost 1,000 degrees and certificates awarded by our college. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> you did that. That, that. That's where we get working together, everybody rowing in the same direction. How do we do better by our students? You did that. Now, part of the backstory of this 3,711 is that we started a, a process called auto confer. So, auto confer allowed us to, to award degrees to people whether they applied for graduation or not. 682 of the degrees awarded were through auto confer. In total, that made for a 35% increase in degrees and certificates awarded. But I was curious about this. So, well, what, what if we pulled that out? Because you know, what, what, what's the real apples to apples comparison here? Well, if we pulled that at 682 out, we still increased the number of certificates and degrees awarded by 10%. Pretty remarkable. I, I always like to remind people how long I've been here because it feels like it's a long time. So, so actually my 12th year as a president starting here this fall, it's really hard to move the needle one or two percent in this world. I, I know that from years and years of trying. To see it go up like this, uh, what it tells me is that a lot of initiatives and a lot of effort and a lot of individual commitment has made a tremendous difference for our students. And the last thing I want to tell you about this is this is, I just want to remind you that th this accomplishment comes in an atmosphere of declining enrollment. So even as we have fewer students that we're getting to serve, we're increasing the number of students significantly who are succeeding at the endeavor of attending college. So another marker, and, and I like to think about these markers as being sort of like healthy. You, know, you go to the doctor for your checkup and you get your blood pressure number and your pulse rate and your cholesterol numbers. And those are biomarkers for how healthy a person is. And, and these are markers, uh, graduates, retention rate, enrollment, that are markers for how healthy our college is. And, and I think that they are, are that important, that we should be looking at these as critical things. 
Retention has been sort of our relentless focus for the last six years, and, and we've made incredible strides with this. If you've been around at these meetings, you've probably heard me talk about this, but 2010, 2011, we were at 47.3% retention, which put us right at the bottom of the community college system in terms of retention rates. I remember well talking to Dr. McAllen about coming to work at Pikes Peak Community College, and I said, well, what's up with the retention rates? And she said, well, you know, there's this huge military population there. There's lots of transients. Don't worry about it. It's great college. And I said, oh, well, we, we should still work on that. And so we have worked on that. There's no other college in our system that's even close to having recorded six consecutive years of retention rate improvements. And you did this. So I look at this. We went from 47.3% to this past year from fall of 15 to fall of 16. That's, of course, the most recent data we have. We don't know quite where we are for fall of 17, but I have my fingers crossed that we can continue this trend. But from fall of 15 to 16, we were at 52%, which means that we went from the bottom of the heap right to the very top of the heap. I don't know, I haven't seen Front Range's numbers, but they've typically been the top performer. They certainly serve a very different population than we do, but we're gonna be right at the top of the heap here uh, among the community colleges in Colorado. <laughs> and you did that, and thank you for your commitment, for the difference you made in the lives of our students, helping them stay in school. Enrollment. Not quite as healthy a marker as what we have on the other two, but we're, we're getting a hold of it. So you can see easily from the graph in academic year 10-11, we hit our peak. And since then, as the uh, recovery from the recession has gone on, we've slowly lost bits of enrollment, 2 to 3% a year. We've certainly never had the dramatic fall-offs in enrollment, double-digit losses that some of our sister colleges have had. But we have had pretty steady losses down to where we are uh, for academic year 16, 17. We were at 8,884 FTE versus the 10,826 when we were at our, our peak and largest. Right now, I just heard the mayor talk about this recently. Mayor Southers said that we were at the lowest unemployment levels ever recorded in Colorado Springs. So that's a tough environment for us to work in. But I'm pretty confident that we're going to be very close to even. I saw this morning, uh, thank you, Lee Ling, the numbers were out early, that we were down half of a percent in FTE for fall semester. We're starting a week later than we did last year, so you're going to see some volatility in those numbers. They're going to jump up and down a little bit over the next couple of weeks. I think that we will settle out. I'm, I'm pretty confident we will settle out very close to even. Probably less than 1% up or down would be my best guess. The story behind these numbers is maybe a little bit more interesting than that. And the story behind these numbers is that with record low unemployment in Colorado Springs and the El Paso County Pikes Peak region, we have, ha have gotten clobbered with working age adults. So if you look at people aged 25 to 50, we're, we're down about 50% with, those, with that population. But at the same time, we've turned around and made big gains in younger students. So the, the back story to that to me is that we're doing a great job of getting the word out about Pikes Peak Community College, about building our reputation, about building uh, the, the knowledge and influence that we have in our local high schools, because we're making big gains with those students. And so I think what's happening is because we're building our reputation and because we're getting better known, that more families are being savvier shoppers for higher education and saying, I don't want to spend thirty or forty thousand dollars a year for the same education that I can get or better at Pikes Peak Community College for six thousand dollars. My kids go into to Pikes Peak Community College, and I'm meeting a lot of those people who are saying just that to me out in our community. And you did that, and thank you. So one of the things about enrollment that, that's inescapable is that, that it connects to the business of the college. And, and here's where we are, uh, probably the most important metric from the, the, the whole college perspective is how are we doing in our reserves? Are we, are we maintaining reserves? Are we eating them up because we're, we're operating beyond our means? Uh, 
uh, in FY16, we kind of hit an all-time high point of a little, little bit over $40 million in reserves. We have a lot of construction projects going, as you know. Uh, the uh, Aspen building, the Learning Commons, the hillside on the south side of the campus, the north side, the uh, Marie Walsh Sharp Creative Commons, many, many projects. So we're down a little bit in our reserves, and this is A-OK, -okay, not a problem. We're at $38.5 million. My commitment to the college has been that I think that we should maintain a reserve of at least three months. And so three-month reserve for us is about $20 million, and we're about $18 million above that number. And what I really want you to know is that in this period of declining enrollment, we've planned well, we've operated smart, we're in a strong financial position. We have not, and nor will we have any need to ever consider or think about doing layoffs. We're in a great place financially, and we're very strong, and we will we will keep going with that. So I just want you to be assured we're in good shape. Another place where we've just experienced extraordinary new success at Pikes Peak is in our foundation. And this year, we are awarding $1.1 million in scholarships. That's 332 students who are benefiting. One of the different thing, things that we're doing differently with the foundation is we're making sure that foundation gifts are large enough to really be impactful and really help support students' success. So we used to have a lot of scholarships that were $300 or $200. We're just not doing those anymore. We're averaging $3,300 per scholarship. We don't have any that are less than 1000 anymore. And so... Um, the, the average scholarship size, $3,300. Another huge change for us is 868 students applied for scholarships. They applied for 4,500 different opportunities. 868 scholarship applicants is a huge sea change for us. We used to have a hard time giving away a much smaller amount of money. We used to be around $200,000, between two hundred and dollars $300,000, and we couldn't get enough applicants to give that those funds away. Because you invested in this, because you believed in this, you talked it up in your classrooms, you talked to students who would be great applicants. We ended up with, with 868 students applying for scholarships at Pikes Peak, and thank you for the impact you made there in bringing students to, our uh, to the, the foundation. Here, here's some more numbers about what we're raising as a uh, foundation. $1.76 million in academic year 1516, and that was fantastic. It was a, a huge jump, and you'll, I'll show you a graph in just a moment in our um, fundraising for the foundation. But it was supported in large part by a million-dollar gift from the Marie Wall Sharp Foundation. So the million-dollar gift really boosted us up. This past year, in academic year 1617, we raised 1.53 million, no million dollar gift, no bequest, just a lot of hard work, grassroots, knocking on doors, raising funds, building our reputation in the community. And, and so that puts us on a trajectory, I believe, to be able to continue this work. So here, here's what it looks like. And for many years, this is what foundation fundraising looks like. Oh, my little red dot went away. Oh, there it is. So for years, this is what we did. And then we started getting a little bit more aggressive. And you can see these little peaks. Those are typically bequests. So often, uh, not often, every few years, there might be somebody who left some funds to Pikes Peak Community College in a will. Uh, here's the, the year where we got the Marie Walsh Sharp gift. And here we are this past year, down just slightly but grassroots fundraising, and that makes a huge difference. So I want to say a big thank you to our foundation. We also have an extraordinary foundation board that is supporting that work, and one of our board members joined us today, Phil Tinsley. You see it. Phil, thanks for joining us. Phil is a longtime treasurer of our foundation and a tireless supporter out in the community of Pikes Peak Community College. Thank you, Phil, and to the whole board. We've made great strides over the last year in diversity and inclusion as well, and, and Keith Barnes has been on just a little bit longer than a year. He has been 
um, steadily marching forward with the work of diversity and inclusion for our college. If you haven't seen it, these are our vision and mission statements for the the diversity and inclusion team to strive for a more unified campus where all people are valued, treated fairly, and possess a sense of belonging. I think that's a wonderful vision statement and one that certainly our college should embrace. They've put together five key goals that they would like to, uh, 10 key goals. I'm, I'm going to hit five of them really quickly, and I'm going to invite you to connect with Keith if you're interested in being more involved in any of this work. The first is to create opportunities to increase the pool of qualified applicants from underrepresented populations. So we would like for our faculty and staff a long-term goal for the college to reflect the diversity of our student body. Uh, to administer diversity training for search committee members. So one of the challenges that search committees certainly face is how do you value diversity in that process? And so we're working on formalizing some of that process to, to give people information and, and knowledge about how exactly that could or should be done. To increase employee and student population and cultural competence training sessions. So what is cultural competence? What does it mean in your classroom? How do you bring cultural competence and, and sensitivity to all populations that, that you're talking to and teaching? If you're interested in those questions, Keith will be holding uh, training sessions throughout the year. Number four, disaggregate data. So if we want to know how different populations are doing at our college, if we want to be serious about serving them and identifying gaps and making up those gaps, then we've got to disaggregate our data by student populations to see exactly how they're doing. And number five is uh, recruiting diverse students. So making sure that all populations of, of our Pikes Peak region know that they are welcome and invited and, um, and, and really encouraged to pursue uh, higher education at Pikes Peak Community College. So one of the things that I think about with these five goals is that if we want to continue to increase graduation numbers, if we want to continue to increase retention rates, these are things we're going to have to succeed at because certainly the, the underserved populations of our region are a significant part of the student body at Pikes Peak Community College. So I encourage you, if you're interested in getting in more involved in these areas, contact Keith Barnes and, and seek out that opportunity, please. Accreditation is, uh, we, we've got a little visit coming up. It's coming up about a year from now. And so with accreditation, in 2014, we were given a 10-year uh, accreditation. We were given really high marks in that. But we had to change pathways. So we were on peak pathways. That was every 10 years you get a visit. Now we're on open pathways, and that means that you get sort of incremental visits or interim visits all along the way. And we have one of these mid-cycle reviews coming up. It's scheduled for, I think I said next year, uh, July 29th, 2019. But what's happening is that we've got some rewrites to do. We've got some documentation to put together. And so if you're asked to help the team out, I would just ask you, please do that. They're, they have a lot of work to do to, to get us there. And that work is well underway. Many people are involved in it, and many more will have to be involved with it by the time we get to the actual visit. Assessment, uh, every, everybody's favorite topic. And, and thank you to Seidel for a wonderful assessment speaker yesterday. Is Christy and Seidel team here. Oh, thank you. You all continue to just bring in fantastic speakers, and, and I know you have a wonderful week of workshops coming up. With assessment, we have five workshops facilitated by our assessment coaches, and I just want to take a moment to thank the assessment coaches. You all have been instrumental in making enormous progress for the college over the last two years. In two years, we've gone from... from um, from where we were, which was collecting a lot of data about assessment, to having really concrete plans about how we collect that data, how we work together across the college, and close the loop. And so thank you so much to all of our assessment coaches. Key focus areas for the coming year, aligning signature assignments with general education outcomes and closing the loop, which closing the loop means how do we use the assessment information to actually improve learning outcomes. So for all of our departments across the college, we've made so much progress, and thank you for engaging in this important work. 
major advances, and, and we have quite a few. And I want to start with the Learning Commons, which is absolutely beautiful. Had a chance to walk through yesterday and talk to some of the, the staff in the Learning Commons. They are abuzz with excitement about this new space and how it's designed. I think that the Learning Commons from the, the first conversations to today took about four years, four years of conversations about how do we better serve students, how do we create spaces that encourage students to engage in tutoring and use academic uh, support. Four years of talking about how we make the money work and, and how in the world do we keep the library open and remodel it at the same time. It was a little bit painful. I owe a huge thank you to the library staff. You guys were amazing in the way that you worked in the atrium and you just made it work and you continue to support students and, and I'm really grateful to you for that. On September 1, we're having a ribbon cutting at the, the Learning Commons, 10 a.m. I would encourage you to come. I think it's really important, especially the, the, the faculty and, and staff members who work directly with students know exactly what services are available in the Learning Commons and how students can engage with those so you can be an ambassador back in your classrooms for the Learning Commons. I encourage you to please come on September 1st if you can. If you can't, uh, Patrice Whitley, who's just done an amazing job of organizing this work and putting together a vision for the Learning Commons. Uh, she's available to come and talk to faculty groups. She's also available to come and speak to your class. So if you have five minutes you could offer Patrice to come and talk to your class and say, what's the Learning Commons and why should you care and how can we help you? She can do that and she can do it in five minutes and really encourage your students to, to get into the Learning Commons. One of the things that I'm excited about with the Learning Commons especially is the Learning Commons app. And for those of you who have been here for years, you've heard me many times stand up here and talk about we're going to use technology in the Learning Commons to break down barriers to students asking for help. We know it's a difficult conversation for students to ask for assistance, and so we thought text messaging, that can help. That, that, that removes that uncomfortable face-to-face. -face. We know that's how the younger generation especially likes to conduct a lot of their difficult conversations. So <laughs> perhaps, perhaps all of us. Uh, so, so I put that challenge out there, and the IT department picked it up and ran with it. And, and Cyril and his team did an amazing job, and they created the Learning Commons app. And so the vision will be a reality, which is that a student can walk into the Learning Commons, find a place that they want to sit, sit down and start working on their work. If they get stuck, or maybe they already knew, know they need help, they can open up the Learning Commons app and request help. And here's what happens when they do that. A tutor back at the uh, main office in the Learning Commons will get that request, and that tutor will see the student's name, We'll see the student's schedule so they know exactly, for example, which math class that student is in. They'll get a picture of the student, and they will get geolocation information about the student. So there's, there's geolocators all over the new learning commons, which allows the tutor to see exactly where that student is sitting. The, the student, on the other hand, will get a picture of the tutor who's coming to help them, and will get an estimate of how long it will take that tutor to arrive. So, so for the students sitting there, opens up the Learning Commons app, requests help. Somebody comes up and sits next to them. It's going to look just like their friend just came and sat down next to them. It's going to be that easy. It's going to be invisible to anybody else that that student is requesting tutoring or help. And I think that we can significantly reduce the barriers to students requesting help and getting the help they need. And we know that students who use tutoring services have much higher course passage rates and graduation rates. So if this drives up student usage, then we're all going to be winners, and our students especially. So to our IT team, thank you. <laughs> you know, I thought this app was so innovative. I went to the, ended up going to the Attorney General's office for Colorado. They're our attorneys, and saying, hey, could we, could we get this product licensed? And uh, and we're going down that path. So we have to prove it works in our hands. 
they want to see if any of the other colleges in Colorado want to take it up. And if they do, they're going to go through a licensing process so that this could actually be sold to other colleges and universities around the country. I want to speak just a moment about the Marie Walsh Sharp Learning Commons. It is opening for fall semester. It's really a beautiful, incredible space. The, the team there, our, our art faculty working in collaboration with our physical plant folks just did an absolutely beautiful job on the design. Of course, this, uh, this uh, Marie Walsh Sharp Creative Commons is possible because of a $1 million gift from the Marie Walsh Sharp Foundation. Uh, I think we pretty well have that gift spent and then a little more, but it is really beautiful space. One of the things that right now, if you go and see the space, is we have plate glass windows that are facing the west out of the, the Marie Walsh Sharp Creative Commons. Those will be coming out in about six weeks, and we'll be putting in garage doors that are glass so that it can truly be opened up to the, the patio and the, the, the statuary that will be out there in an indoor-outdoor art uh, learning space. And for us, this is going to be an opportunity to really push forward our visual arts programs. We have the only studio-based visual arts degrees available in the Pikes Peak region from a public college, and, and this will push that even further. I think we will be able to attract more talented faculty, more people who want to be part of our team, and more talented students who also want to be part of this. It's going to be the cornerstone of, of that program, and, and we'll be doing PDW tomorrow afternoon in the, the Marie Walsh Sharp Creative Commons. If you have a chance to come and see it, please do. You don't have to listen to the speech again, but you can come in and just see it. It really is beautiful space, wonderfully designed. I want to thank our art faculty for their engagement with this. Uh, I know our students are going to really thrive in this new space, so thank you. We have lots of other capital projects. I have so much good stuff to tell you about. I'm not going to tell you about all of it. I'm going to tell you about one thing on here, the black box collaboration with the Pikes Peak Library District. This is the kind of thing I love, where different organizations in our community can come together. We can find partners and better serve students. We're not sure this will work out. It is in conversation. But um, if you go to the very northeast corner of our downtown studio campus, and you go further east, about 12 feet, you'll run into the Knights of Columbus building. And the Knights of Columbus building is this beautiful old historic building. It's got this great character. It has real feel and personality to it. Uh, I had a chance to tour it with uh, Jonathan Spears, who's the CEO of the Public Library District, a few weeks back. And we talked about the possibility of the Black Box Theater being located in this space. Uh, Jonathan has a lot of process he has to go through because, of course, the Pikes Peak Library District is a very public organization. He's holding stakeholder meetings and talking to different people about what they'd like to do. He's already agreed to host Flux Capacitor, which is this sort of do-it-yourself uh, alternative mu music venue, which I think is super cool. He's bringing in young adults to Flux Capacitor who would have no no affiliation with the public library otherwise, and they're getting connected that way. So he's doing that at night. He said, what about during the day if we use some of this space to, to host a black box theater on performance nights? You know, we could, we could work in between flux capacitor schedule and, and have things there. I think this is a great idea. It's really innovative, and it's super cool space. If, if, you're, if you're a stakeholder in this especially and you're interested in knowing more about it, uh, let me know. Uh, we can definitely arrange a tour and get you through this space as well to get a sense of what it's all about. But I, I love this idea. And lots of other projects too. If you have questions about projects that are going on, I'll, I'll finish with questions. And of course, we have Bob Rogers and, and Paul and, and Matthew uh, all available to talk about projects as well. Um, um, Brenda Lauer is probably here as well, so let me know, but in the interest of time, I'm going to run us along. Facilities master planning will be going on this fall, and what I want you to know about it is you're in, you will be invited to participate. So I have had quite a few uh, um, 
uh, folks who have suggestions for how they would use some of the about to become available space as the Writing Center and the LAC and the Math Center relocate into the Learning Commons. Lots of suggestions coming in about how we could use that space. I want to make sure we have a free and open process where, where we gather all the best ideas from the college and talk about what's the highest and best use of those spaces uh, moving forward. So we're going to have stakeholder meetings. I expect we'll have at least one or more in here where the faculty, staff, and students are all invited. Come and talk to us about what you'd like to see. So, so part of it is how we reuse those spaces. Part of it is about whether we have adequate space, whether we should redesign any of our space, whether we could, should construct or acquire new space. So all of that is incorporated within facilities master planning. It's a process we have to go through to request funding from the state, but it's also just a good exercise for us to evaluate what to evaluate how we're using our current space. So, um, so you'll see invitations to participate in this coming out throughout fall semester. We hope to be done by December. And we have a lot of innovation going on, and I want to start with our pilot programs. So we started a pilot program process two years ago this past spring, and, and I really like this process. One of the, the fundamental tenets that underlies the pilot program process is that certainly leadership at the college by no means has any, any monopoly on good ideas. And, and what could we be doing, and how do we engage the whole college in talking about good ideas that would engage our students and help them be more successful? So we talk about the, the pilot program process as being what are ideas that would engage many students and help them be more successful? And are there small physical plant projects that we should consider? Uh, in this year's uh, selections, we had a team that was uh, appointed by faculty senate of full-time and adjunct faculty members. We had uh, student government appointed members. We had classified staff and APT appointed members, and then my team, my staff. And so we were the ones who looked at about 30 different uh, proposals, and we came up with six that we're going to fund. We had about a quarter of a million dollars set aside. That was the same thing that we did two years ago. We used a similar team. Two years ago, we, we initiated, I think, five different pilot projects. A couple were small physical plant projects. A couple didn't end up working out. The data didn't ultimately support them. And one was permanently funded, which was writing fellows. Uh, it was a proposal from Andy Scott and Crystal Sear when Crystal was still here. They did a wonderful job with that. And their vision about it was right on target, and, and writing fellows has become a permanent part of our college. I hope that many of this year's pilot project programs will also become permanent parts of our college. The first one funded is an online student newspaper. It's a collaboration between many different departments. And so when I first saw online newspaper, I thought, oh, this might be pretty narrow and not impact a lot of students. But it is students in journalism and English and multigraphic design and help me, what else? Photography, thank you, and, and others will be invited. And so if you're interested in this, what I want people to know are who are the project proposal sponsors, because those are the people to talk about, and I'm going to get my notes out, make sure I get all of the project proposal sponsors. Uh, this one was Deidre Schoolcraft. If you're interested in the school newspaper, uh, Deidre would be the person to talk to. Online catalog database. We have really struggled keeping one aligned college catalog between online and print versions and, and updates, and sometimes people get updates, sometimes people don't. It's been quite a challenge, and so our IT department proposed a, an online catalog database. Surreal Parent is the owner of this project. If you're interested in the work that he's proposing, it is to acquire technology and implement it here at the college that will support a, a consistent database. Uh, the Flipped Science Classroom is sponsored by Dr. Alyssa Blystone. Alyssa, are you here? Nope, I think Rampart. Um, but uh, Alyssa's idea is that, that uh, in the science classroom, the lectures could be recorded and students watch those outside the classroom and then in the classroom they do 
projects and uh, experiments and group work that really allows a higher level of engagement for the student when they're in the classroom. Uh, Hidden Figures Project, uh, this one is sponsored by Jackie Gators Jordan, I think. Is that right, Jackie? Yes. yes. And Hidden Figures is based on the, the movie and the book about uh, African Ameri a group of African American women who were instrumental in the, the data analysis and, and development of the Apollo program. And the idea and vision behind this is to engage more uh, students of color and, and underrepresented populations in science, technology, engineering, math programs. The Rampart Range uh, Campus Auto Door Opener. This is the kind of small physical plant project we do, but we have big heavy doors on the, the enrollment services testing area at Rampart, and we need auto door openers, so this project was funded. Uh, I think Kevin Hudgens, I think you were the proposer for that. Thank you. And last, we have Passport for Completion. You know, when we do the pilot project program, remember the comment about uh, leadership doesn't have a monopoly on good ideas. Every faculty, staff, student uh, at the college is invited to participate in the process. This is actually a student um, proposal. Stephen Holmes, who many of you know, was the proposer behind this. Uh, for a couple of years, Phi Theta Kappa ran this, this program, and it was a great program. It was working extremely well. It asks students that to, to take a passport, and there's a physical document. They go around to different offices and get it stamped and learn about a little bit about how each of those offices can support them in their journey as a student. And so we love this project. Phi Theta Kappa cannot continue to just run the same project year after year after year and meet the requirements of the organization. They, the organization wants to see new students coming in, taking leadership and running new projects and programs. So I think for the first time that I know of, the college took a PTK proposal or, or project that they have been running and said, we'll incorporate this permanently into the college and do this. So, so Stephen was the, the proposer behind this and we'll continue this. Uh, what started and has been running for a couple of years as a PTK project. So thanks to PTK for that. Gwen Rolfing. Uh, next up, I want to talk about the quad. I'm so excited about this. I could actually do a whole hour and a half just on the quad. Uh, those of you, again, who this, I have two themes. You did it. You made it happen. And boy, you've been hearing this for years. And yeah, boy, you've been hearing this for years. For, for probably at least three years, uh, we've been talking about building a collaborative space between Pikes Peak Community College, Colorado College, UCCS, and the Air Force Academy. And, and we did it, and, and we finally made this happen. We had a grand opening back in April. It was attended by about two to 300 people was the estimate. We had the mayor came and spoke, some entrepreneurs came and spoke, students who, who had been involved with the program spoke, and, and I spoke on behalf of all the institutions about the vision behind this. And, and the vision behind it was really about a, a few key things, keeping our best and brightest students who are coming out of our institutions in Colorado Springs and giving them a place to, to thrive and grow, connecting those students with um, visionary leaders in our community, whether they're government leaders or business leaders or uh, venture capitalists and people that, that support new business startups, and finally having those students make an impact in our community together. And so this summer we ran the third uh, summer intensive program I want to really encourage you, if you have students who are right for this, and these would be students who are interested in innovation, interested in solving the world's problems, curious about how, how the world works and, and how to make things happen and have an impact. If you have students like that in your classroom, please encourage them to connect with the, the quad program. The quad program is run by Jacob Eichengreen. Jacob's a brilliant young man who grew up here in Colorado Springs, went to the Wharton School of Business, joined a group called Venture for America, got sent out to Las Vegas, worked for Tony Shea, who was the owner of Zappos, sold it for a gazillion dollars to Amazon, and, and decided that he was going to make Las Vegas into the entrepreneur capital of the world. And uh, uh, Jake worked directly from him. Then Jake went off on a Fulbright scholarship to Africa, 
worked to, to start up a business, and he did start a business in Africa. And I uh, spent a year calling Jake early in the morning and late at night when he was in Africa trying to talk him into coming back and running the quad program for him. And, and the basic pitch was, look, if you can uh, start a business in Africa and in, in Uganda and you can make that work and, and it's such an unpredictable environment to, to operate in, then you can probably manage four college presidents and make this work. And, and so he did. And that, that's actually how the quad works, is we have a board of directors. It's the four institution leaders. And, uh, and so the summer intensive program this year, instead of working on entrepreneur ideas, which is uh, in the individual business ideas, which is what they did last year, and, and they had some great ones. My fa- favorite, I think, is a, a business that's still up and running it, that, that was started at the Quad Center, and it was the selfie drone, and, and it was an idea that students came up together. There were Pikes Peak students and Colorado College students and UCCS students all on the team, and they came up with an idea for a drone that could be deployed from your phone, controlled by the GPS, would stay within 10 or 12 feet of you, and, and you know, would follow you down the mountain when you were skiing or mountain biking and take pictures of you so you could impress all your friends. And uh, it's actually really a cool idea, and they're, they're still operational with that idea. But we decided this year to do something different, which was that groups of students in the summer intensive program would take on some bigger issues. And, and one of the things that we're seeing is that students coming into the quad program, they want to work on, often they want to work on social issues. They are very, very energized to make the world a better place and to have an impact. And so I was one of about a dozen people who went in and pitched different ideas to this group of students about things that they they could do. And uh, so I pitched housing and food insecurity among college students. And other people came in and talked about the aging population and their needs in our community. Colorado Springs Utilities came in and and presented about peak demand and and how they might could level off demand. And there were others. Two groups ended up working on homelessness from the summer intensive program. One group worked on Colorado Springs Utilities uh, issue around trying to smooth out demand of electricity, which sounds kind of boring, but actually ended up, I think, being really, really interesting project. And they had a, a couple of other projects. The students coming out of this every year for the last three summers consistently say things like, this changed my life. This completely changed my viewpoint. I had a young man one day who told me coming out of the summer intensive program, he said, I'm, I'm planning to be a math teacher, and I'm still planning to be a math teacher, but I'm going to be so much better math teacher because I went through this program and, and connected to ideas around how to reach people and how to see the challenges as opportunities uh, in an entrepreneurial way. So approaching math teaching as an entrepreneur. So students are having remarkable experiences and, and really rubbing shoulders with, with r- remarkable leaders. We had people from the governor's office, for example, down to look at the program. And as a result, the governor got fired up about this. And he's giving us $26,000 for the, the coming year. $26,000 will be used to pay students who will be in the quad program to help solve problems for a business in our community. So there'll be a a competition. Businesses will say, here's the problem I need help with, and they'll have a group of students that will work on it. And that's actually going to be the the ongoing funding model for the quad program, is we'll have groups of innovative, creative, ambitious students from all the institutions working together. We'll engage with government, nonprofits, and business, and they'll have a chance to pitch problems to this group. We take on a problem, they pay the group of students to work on it, and, uh, and they end up, I think, with really creative, interesting solutions. And so what a wonderful opportunity for our students and for our community uh, to, to be able to engage with our students in this way. So I'm really cr- proud of where the quad program is. If you haven't seen it, uh, this, is, this is actually the door, and it's uh, so, oh, super cool picture. Matt, did you take this picture? I think it was Karen. Karen oh, Karen, great picture. This, this is the outside door, and it's just reflecting back. But you can see the initials of each of the institutions. And this is some of the indoor space. And this is located beneath Loyal Coffee. Loyal is south, just south of the core of downtown on Nevada. And it's immediately north of uh, Blue Dot Apartments, which is the new multi-story apartment building 
there on South Nevada. Stop in if you have a chance. See this wonderful space. If you want to have some engagement with the quad, please let me know. If you'd like to have Jake come and speak to a group of students, please let me know. We can make that. We can definitely make that happen. And talk this up to your students. Students are having remarkable experiences engaging in the quad program. All right, we have two new programs coming online in the, the coming year. And the first I want to talk about a little bit is construction. But following construction on the heels of construction will be cybersecurity. So we have construction classes starting this fall and next week. Uh, they're, they're in a new facility. We didn't have any place for to put construction. And so we leased space from uh, in a big manufacturing building over on Newport Road, which is close to the airport. It's very close to where we already are operational in the Springs Fabrication Building where we teach welding. And so the construction program will consist of two certificates, the, the Building and Construction Advanced Applications and Building and Construction Fundamentals. And we'll, we will have an associate's degree as well with the, the construction program. Um, I want to th say a special word of thanks to, to Michelle Coster. I got that. See, you see that pronunciation? <laughs> I, was, I was gently reminded one day of uh, correcting Michelle's pronunciation of her last name. But Michelle, boy, you've been phenomenal in supporting this. I just want to say thank you. And, and so, yeah. Michelle is a phenomenal instructor and supporter of our students. Uh, typically with a new program, if we have 20 to 25 students come into a new program, we figure that's a, a, a big win for us. I think we're going to be starting construction with close to 100 students. I think we have classes that are already full and closed out. There is a huge demand for people with these skills and good paying jobs, and there are a lot of people out there looking for these skills, so I'm really excited about the construction program, and thank you, Michelle, and, and all of your team for everything you've done. Michelle, oh, oh help me. Uh, who, who's, what's your new faculty member's name? We should... I, oh, thank you, Dave Frankman, Dave Frankmore and Fernando. Welcome to our team. It's hard to see out there, just so you know. <laughs> so, uh, also starting up this year are new certificates and programs in uh, cybersecurity, and supporting these are a couple of big grants that we've gotten. But cybersecurity will primarily start, uh, we, we've already been teaching a lot of cybersecurity and, and students coming through programs able to sit for certification exams, but we'll have new degrees coming on board and those will really be starting in the spring of 18. We're renovating two rooms over in the B building to support that to create a cyber range as well as one at Rampart. Uh, uh, updating that cyber range, and we're also working to lease space at the Catalyst campus for, to support this as well. These cyber ranges are really quite interesting, a pretty significant investment for the college, but they are, are unconnected local area networks that are self-contained, and they allow students to work with viruses and malware and all sorts of nasty things without having those released uh, into the, the larger college community. And yeah, so, so pretty important. So they're a little bit like the, the cyber version of a shooting range, a place where you can safely go and do very dangerous things. Uh, the, the cybersecurity program has been bolstered by a couple of big grants. One was the RAMPS Cyber Prep Program, getting high school students into cyber careers. We had a number of high school students who got internships working in places like Bocor and, and Route 9B and others this summer and had wonderful experience. And then we have a Department of Defense Office of Economic Adjustment grant of almost $900,000. A big chunk of that goes to our chamber EDC to help uh, cyber defense companies develop their technology for civilian use and, and use it that way, but also to help us become an NSA certified uh, institution to teach cybersecurity, which is really critical and, and obviously aligned with our community and the, the cyber defense industry that we have here. So we're making a lot of headway on those two and, and really leading the charge for, for cybersecurity. We'll, we'll, 
from my point of contact has primarily been Rob Hudson. Debbie Sagan's been very involved in these grants. We've received quite a bit of national attention for the RAMPS grant and our connection to employers and being really employer driven with this. And that's good for our students to make sure that we're teaching the skills that will really get them employed. So thanks to all of you. We are very close with our, our first BAS degree. It will be the third one offered in the community college system uh, statewide, and it is a BAS in Emergency Services Administration. We're going to try to headquarter this program out at the shooting range as the, the city and, and county move to their own shooting ranges, and we're able to take over that space fully. And so, so this has been a tremendous undertaking. I want to say a special word of, of thanks to Rob Hudson and his team for just an enormous amount of administrative work to get this approved and through, through the state and the HLC and everything else that has to happen with it. We also have a new program, the Certified Dietary Manager, which is uh, Andrea Ulrich and, and her team have worked on this. So excited about both of these programs coming online this year as well. <laughs> Career Boost is a grant that we received, four and a half million dollar grant, a big grant cro across much of the state. For us, it is a grant that is a partnership with District 11 in particular and helps to get students who are not college ready yet into career pathways in manufacturing information technology and child development. Um, of this four and a half million dollar grant, about 490,000 is coming to Pikes Peak Community College. For, for reasons of time, I'm going to say Debbie Sagan and her team in the workforce area is running this grant and, and um, so the lead uh, investigators for the grant. So if you're interested in more information, you want to connect with Debbie. Uh, she's the source of information. Uh, forwarding division. So last spring at PDW, I came out and talked about our new strategic uh, plan, which we're calling Destination 2022. Uh, very excited about what we put together in there. Big college effort to, to put together a five-year strategic plan, and it's huge. And one of the challenges with these huge plans is, is how do you make progress with them? So we're going back to a strategy that's worked very well for us of having focus goals. So we pick out of that big strategic plan a few focus goals every year, and we say this is what we're going to drill in on for the next 12 to 24 months, and then we'll pick additional focus goals. And by the time we get through the five years, hopefully we've, we've made a huge progress. I'm really excited about what we're doing here because as much success as we've had, when we sit down and talk about these focus goals, all of which are fundamentally driven by the idea of improving student retention, we see so much potential to do even better. We see so many places where we could do things that would further impact student success and, and, and help more students succeed. So we picked these four goals We've had big meetings about each of these four goals. With each of these four goals, we've had at least five really quality ideas of tactics that we could employ, um, and, and they're big, across the whole college. And so that would be 20 tactics. And I keep saying back to this very enthusiastic group that's been working on it. It's been an open process. We've had lots of people engage. We've had faculty, faculty senate uh, represented. We've had uh, deans there. We've had classified staff. Terry uh, has been amazing, part of that team. And, and so we've come up with these four goals, and I said, we've got to pick one. What's the one thing that can make the most difference? Let's do one thing really well with each of these, and let's have a great impact with it. And so we've really challenged ourselves. What's the one thing that can make the most difference? Creating smarter schedules is going to be about every student in their first semester has a clear pathway of what they have to do each semester to reach their finish line. And that's being led by uh, Lincoln Wolf and Wayne Artis, and I appreciate both of you for your leadership. Uh, improving faculty engagement is our challenge there that we, we ended up settling on is institutionalizing a small number of best practices for every faculty member in every classroom. 
Focus goal number three, three is improving math success. And for that one, we ended up deciding to focus, really focus in on math pathways and make sure that our students are taking the right math classes. This is going to be a big undertaking. It sounds like it's a math department issue. It is not. It is a college-wide issue. The, the big driver behind math pathways is getting all of our students into the right level math. Right now, we have far too many students who are taking college algebra, Math 121, instead of quantitative literacy, Math 120. We have a huge gap in the success rates between Math 120 and 121. And we have many departments that are still advising and requiring students and suggesting students take Math 121. Public universities across Colorado have really implemented Math 120 and program most of their programs. Math 121 is primarily appropriate where the student needs to progress on to calculus. If the student does not need to progress on the calculus, we think they should be in Math 120. We're going to have some big college-wide symposiums to talk about this, to talk about advising, to talk about program requirements, and how do we align math pathways to ensure the best success for all of our students and that we're giving them the math skills that really support them in the career paths that they're choosing. And finally, and we just finished goal number four this past Thursday, these are, we've been taking on one a week for the past four weeks, creating more strategic first semester academic success plans. And so this is really about the fact that, that we know that students who fail classes in their first semester have dramatically lower graduation and retention rates. So we're looking for strategies to really uh, help students, fully support students in that first semester. And we came away from that uh, big conversation and so many great ideas with a focus on increasing a sense of belonging among our students. That, that we think that, that creating a sense of belonging and connectedness to the college is really the key there. It helps students be able to ask. It, it makes it easier for students to be able to request help and ask for help and get the resources they need. How am I doing on time? Oh, 15 minutes. I'll go, I'll go quickly. Internal communications is uh, effort. It's something that every time we do surveys at the college about how we're doing, this has come up as a challenging area. You'll remember we've done some things. I did a, uh, a, a, a college newsletter for a while that, that Allison and I put together and sent out every week. The week we had 33 people open it, we just said, okay, we give up. We're, we're, this is clearly not meeting people's needs. And so we have some new efforts coming along. And campus collaborators and campus communicators are two new groups that are coming together to work on improving campus communications and internal communications, getting you the information you need. If you are interested in engaging with these, Warren Epstein is the person to talk to, and he'll be uh, assembling these groups uh, fall semester and, and hopefully working throughout the year on some ideas from them. We have an updated logo. This is uh, the Pikes Peak Community College logo now actually looks like Pikes Peak, which I think is a big improvement. And uh, part of the, de the design process is just updating and freshening it and making sure that it's more legible and readable from a distance. This really came about because of the windstorm uh, last year blew out the sign in front of the, the college, and that seemed like an opportunity to our communications team to update the logo. And so they did. So as you're ordering new stationery, new business cards, any kind of new print materials, make sure to get the new logo for, for those. Continue to use anything you have. We don't want to waste materials, but as you update any materials, make sure that you're using the new logo and connecting with um, marketing and communications for that. And a few advancement accolades. We have now a group of adjunct faculty members who have completed Tier 3 adjunct process. I'm really proud of them. They, they've really engaged and embraced this process. They've increased their compensation, but they've also demonstrated significant learning around uh, how to be more effective and impactful in the classroom. So the, the group on the right is a list of adjunct faculty members who've completed Tier 3, and we had a, an additional group that completed Tier 2. This has been a remarkably successful process. I want to thank, uh, I've already 
notice CETL once, but I want to thank CETL again for running this process. It's been exceptionally successful, and we've seen adjunct faculty coming out of this now out of Tier 3 saying, what's next? How do I continue to engage? How do I continue to build my skills? And so I just want to thank CETL for a wonderful job with this process. You know, up until two years ago, we had no way for adjunct faculty to increase their compensation. We didn't really have them engaged in professional development. And now we're doing that in a big, meaningful way. And given that, that adjunct faculty teach almost 50% of our students at Pikes Peak, that's a critically important that we support them. And, and on that note, I, I think that 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 statistic may be shifting a little bit. We right now at Pikes Peak by far and away have the largest percentage of students taught by full-time faculty. And we believe that full-time faculty make a real difference because they're in the classroom and on campus full days, every day is engaged in committee work, engaged in, in student advising and mentoring, which is so critical. And so this year, we're adding 10 new faculty positions at Pikes Peak Community College. So we're making a huge investment uh, after years of sort of being very steady state with faculty, a huge investment in new faculty, bringing on 10 new faculty positions. So... That is an investment that we believe will pay dividends in student success for many years to come. And finally, I'm just noticing there are changes coming up at the Community College System Office. Uh, Dr. McAllen, as you all know, announced her retirement, and I'm putting this up because there will be a public forum on October the 5th. Members of the state board will be here, members of the, the search committee company that's helping with the national search for Dr. McAllen's replacement will be here, and they're inviting in input from every college around what folks are looking for in a system leader. And, and while I'm on changes at the community college system office, there's been quite a few. We have a new interim provost um, who is from Arapahoe Community College. What, what, remind me of the name. Diane Hegman, thank you, is serving for this entire year as the interim provost for the system. And so a number of changes at the, the system level, but in particular, if you're interested in offering input around the, the search for Dr. McAllen's replacement, that opportunity is coming up shortly. And with that, I'm to questions. And, 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 and I, I certainly invite them. I would love to have feedback. Yes, wonderful. I'll, I'll repeat it. If. Okay. Um, I had a lot of students last year that wanted to take classes at Rampart, but there was no bus service when they were up oh. there. So if you couldn't hear, the question was about bus service to Rampart. And I uh, love that question because I believe it was two weeks ago uh, that I went to the mayor's office and pitched him on bus service. So bus service has been quite challenging to us, to the, the Rampart campus. We, we haven't had it in many years. I think in his first year, Mayor Bach cut bus service to the, the north part of the city because there was low ridership and he said the city couldn't afford it. I, I was very frustrated with that right off the bat because a lot of city taxpayers up on the north side were suddenly cut off from bus service, and that included our Rampart campus. There's some, some activity on bus service, and that activity is being driven by new hospital construction on the north side of town. So the hospital providers have been in the year of the mayor and the, the Department of Transportation group at the city saying, we've got to have bus service for both patients, their families, and employees. And so they're asking for that. The, the city is trying to be pretty entrepreneurial about this, to be honest with you. And, and I like entrepreneurial until, until I don't, and I don't. Because they're saying, basically, they're, they're presenting a pay-to-play uh, model to us of, if you pay us enough, we'll send buses to Rampart. And so I went to the mayor and I said, look, most of our healthcare programs, for example, are located at our Rampart campus. A lot of people in areas like Southeast Colorado Springs who don't have good transportation have no way to get there and have an opportunity 
to, to be in those careers, to get the training they need. It's, it's a worthwhile investment for the city to lift people up, to offer the accessibility and bus service to the Rampart campus. And frankly, we can't afford to pay for public transportation. That, that's a city mission, not a Pikes Peak Community College mission. And we need your buses coming to the Rampart campus. And he said, I'll think about it. So that's what I got. I, but I want you to know I'm working on it and I'm engaged in that and doing my very best on it. Were there any lessons from Charlottesville that we should take away? Oh, thank you, Warren. Um, there, there are lessons from Charlottesville, and I, I have a statement I was going to read before I left today, but maybe I'll just talk about this because, because maybe that makes the most sense. One of the things that, that I'm sure you all know, but maybe isn't well known necessarily in the general public, is there was a lot of talk about Charlottesville, but, but what happened actually happened on a university campus. It happened at the University of Virginia there. And, and watching this, putting myself in the shoes of a, an administrator or an employee at the University of Virginia, I thought how I would feel about that and how, how horrified I would be by seeing this on our campus. So I think there's a couple of things that are worth saying about this. Uh, one is certainly that, that as an institution, Pikes Peak Community College will never condone, support, hate speech. We, we, what, what we saw there in the, the, the hate speech and the, the symbology that was brought there tore people down and, and, and damaged, I think, in meaningful ways our society. One of the things that, that, that impacted me so much about this being on a university campus is that we, we're the keepers of knowledge and education, but we're also the keepers of lessons around civility and lessons around uh, dialogue and how that can happen uh, in the right way of, of civil dialogue. Uh, to, uh, just last week on Tuesday morning, we had Senator Cory Gardner on this stage talking to a room full of mostly not supporters. And, and what I saw there, though, was really important to me. I saw democracy in action. I saw people who got up to be here very early in the morning. They were lined up for uh, well ahead of time for a 7.30 opportunity to, to talk to Corey Gardner. And, and they shared displeasure over many things, especially his, his stance on health care. And, and he listened and he responded, and, and he talked about why he did what he did, and people said, you didn't get that right, you should have done it differently. And he got feedback, and, and there was a civil dialogue. It was, it was an energetic dialogue, <laughs> and, and people were quite clear, but there, there was also a civility and a respectfulness to it. People came to the podium, and they addressed him as Senator Gardner, and they thanked him for his statement, for example, about what had happened in Charlottesville, of calling out the white supremacist groups and the neo-Nazis and the hate groups and saying, that's unacceptable in America today. And, and people thanked him for that and recognized that he is striving to do good work, but they also shared with him that he was clearly getting some things wrong in their opinion. America today feels, to me, divided in a way that, that I've not seen it divided. You all, I know many of you, and I know the dialogues and, and, and conversations that you host in your classrooms, and, and I'd encourage you to give students a place to talk about this, but also to give them guidance around what our values are as an institution and how we value diversity and the importance that we put on civil dialogue and the importance that we put on the contribution of every person in America and what they can bring to, to this great nation. So please bring that to your students in your classrooms to the best of your ability this fall. And if you need help with it, we have resources and I'd be happy to have a conversation with you and we can bring in others as well to have those conversations if you're being challenged in your classroom by those conversations and want assistance with them. So thank you. Our, our, I think we might have, I have just a couple of more minutes. Are there other questions?
Yes. The wonderful question, and if you couldn't hear, the question was, is the Learning Commons app only for Centennial or is it useful for all the campuses? Only for Centennial now. We're going to work with it here. We'll see how it goes. We're expecting to have to do some tweaking and eventually to the other campuses as well. How do we download it? Does anybody from IT want to say how we download it? So my, my assumption is that we will send out some links and connections as school starts to, to get students plugged into the Learning Commons app and how to download it. And I believe it's available on the Learning Commons webpage, which you can find right on the CBTC webpage. Okay. Well, I, I rarely make uh, much in the way of decisions on the stage, but I would say we should definitely send that out to all faculty, staff, and students with the link to, to download the Learning Commons app. Here's a question over here. Oh, what a wonderful idea, and, and, and reducing barriers. Th thank you, and, and that, that is exactly barrier reduction. Well, I love that idea. And by the way, IT will have a, a permanent presence in the Learning Commons to support students, so they'll have their own desk in the Learning Commons area. Yes. Oh, there you are. Regina, awesome. What time and where? Oh, what time and place? Oh, it's, it's a training that people have signed up for. You might have standing room only. I hope so. I would love that too. Yes, question. Right. So the question is about smoking on campus and is there any, any effort around it? One of the challenges we've had with smoking on campus, on campus, I'm sorry, is that construction has caused us to have to move the smoking areas multiple times. And because we've put them in temporary places, we probably haven't had the best signage around them. As we're wrapping up the construction out on the front side, the, the north side of Centennial Campus, we'll get a smoking area back there, and I think we'll be able to get up more and better permanent signage to help people with where smoking areas are. I'm not a big fan either. Uh, I've heard a couple of colleges over the years say, well, we were the first college to be smoke-free. We were actually maybe Northeastern Junior College many years ago was the first college, I think, in Colorado to be smoke-free. It doesn't work for Pikes Peak, and, and it just doesn't work. One of the reasons it doesn't work is our campus is too big, and people can't get off campus to do their smoking and then come back to campus. And so we have to find places but the, the temporary smoking areas have really created a barrier to 
in terms of being able to educate people well about where they have to go. So as we settle back down from all this construction, I think we'll be able to make some progress on that. And, and I certainly hope so. I, I support you in that. I'm not a big fan of walking through the smoke clouds either. Yes, question back here. Okay, one more. One more. I'm sorry, the front area. Uh, the, where they're doing the new drop-off area? Yeah. They used uh, to have handicap there, and students are asking me, is it coming back in that area? I don't think it's coming back in that area. We had a lot of spaces that were marked as handicap spaces that did not meet ADA code for handicap parking. So some of the spaces that went away went away because they didn't meet the, the code for it. I do think we'll have... ADA space is coming back behind the B building. Is that correct, Brenda? No, no we will not have. It has to do with the slope. I'm not sure that. Right. Yeah. And what certainly with people have suggested, for example, ELOT, and it just does not meet no. code at all for what handicapped spaces have to be. I would just speak, those students were asking me. Yeah. Right. Not just wheelchair people, but people who have, you know, ambulatory issues or heart issues. Sure. And we have we've we've had two things going on for a long time. One, we've had significantly more spaces than we're required to by ADA law, and we've had a shortage. Mm -hmm. And so so that challenge has sort of been ongoing. We've talked about and looked at some options for um for the area back between sort of B and C building. Significant expense, certainly, in, in doing those. The, the development of the, the west end, nor, northwest lot as a, a handicap lot certainly helped, but I'm, I'm listening and hearing that we probably need more. So I think I'm out of time. I want to be respectful of the, the workshops that are starting after this. Thank you all for being here. I, I, I want to finish by saying, just remind you, we had a remarkable year together, and you made an enormous difference with the students we serve, and I thank you for that.